fighting erupts in the northern Iraqi city of Kirkuk. Will Kurdish forces outgun troops loyal to Baghdad? Or could this be the end of the region's autonomy? I'm Imran Garda, and today's newsmaker is the fighting in Kirkuk. It was a push for independence that's descended into conflict. Voters in northern Iraq overwhelmingly backed a referendum to form their own state. But the Iraqi prime minister had other plans. After multiple warnings, Iraq's central government has launched a major offensive to retake areas of Kirkuk. And the advance has been swift. Within a day, residents say troops loyal to Baghdad have entered the city after seizing an airport, oil fields and nearby industrial towns. Multiple casualties have been reported. It's a big twist in Iraq's ongoing war. Just a year ago, both sides were working together when they launched a joint operation to take back Mosul from Daesh. Well, to talk about this more, I'm joined from Baghdad by retired Brigadier General Mark Kimmett. He used to be the U.S. military spokesman in Iraq. Also from Baghdad, Ali Dabar. He's a former Iraqi government spokesman. And in Washington, D.C., Paul Davis, he's a retired military intelligence analyst. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Ali Dabar, if I can begin with you, sir. I understand that Baghdad wants to teach the KRG a lesson. It was unhappy with the referendum, but things are very ugly on the ground in Kirkuk right now. Isn't Baghdad risking a full-blown civil war by this intervention? I don't think so. Haider uh, al-Abadi trying to be very uh, careful when dealing with this and it is a redeployment of the military forces and the police and the federal police force and definitely the situation in Kirkuk and the behavior of the governor as well as the Kurdish authority which they took over Kirkuk and uh, give it a Kurdish kala which is definitely is, is against uh, as it, against constitution plus pumping the oil and taking over the oil fields and the airport and uh, down the flag of the federal government. This is all, all it is against the law and against the constitution. Uh, although that the federal government, they had a full patience not to take any step and not to, uh, uh, not to undermine their effort to fight ISIS, but again, uh, the behavior of the governor as well as the Kurdish didn't allow Abadi to, 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 to stop. But again, there is, uh, 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 there is less clashes. I think now the uh, Iraqi military forces, they succeeded in capturing the airport as well as the governorate office, and they are rising the, raising the flag there and the oil field as well. And they, they are moving without that much clashes between the Iraqi forces and Bishmarga. Paul Davis, who's in the wrong here? Well, we want to talk about uh, the situation on the ground and how, how it uh, evolved. And uh, I hear that, uh, that we talk about uh, this is an unconstitutional move on the part of uh, the KRG uh, and that the Kirkuk is a federal area. However, we go back to the initial establishment of the new uh, Iraq and Article 140 of the... Well, we seem to have lost Paul Davis for the moment. We'll try and get him back. Let me bring in Mark Kimmett here. Mark Kimmett, the fact that U.S. weapons are involved on both sides of this, does that worry you? Uh, I think the United States is on both sides. I, I heard a little bit of what Colonel Davis was saying, and I can tell him that the situation looks very, very different on the ground. Uh, there really are no significant challenges here on a constitutional basis. While Colonel Davis was quoting Article 140. Article 1 of the Constitution says that Iraq will remain a free and unified uh, country, and any change to that has to be done with a two-thirds parliamentary majority, which has not happened. So I, I think what we need to do is everybody at this point needs to calm down. The United States is trying to mediate on both sides. They are trying to make this, as you say, not a civil war. We need to remain focused on ISIS. We need to remain focused on pushing ISIS out of the country. Anything that diverts from that is fundamentally unhelpful. So I would hope that both the government in Baghdad and the government, the, the KRG regional government in 
Erbil can come to a quick agreement so we can get back to the, ma the major issue at hand, which is the defeat of ISIS. Ali Dabak, would you agree that the longer this continues, all the different players are taking their eye off the ISIS ball and Daesh will only be strengthened and emerge or re-emerge in the vacuum? Well, always the vacuum of power uh, allows and give a chance to ISIS to come again. But uh, I think that the, as Kemet said, that it is not so uh, hard, the situation in Kirkuk, the federal government is taking over without uh, any that major challenges. Uh, I think that the Kurdish regional government, they do need to understand that they cannot continue on violation, this violation. The close 140, I would just want to add, the close 140 didn't allow the Kurdish to dominate and to take over Kirkuk. It is a joint, a joint uh, administration. Uh, I just remind you that uh, earlier the United States was also a third party which, which also uh, helping in, 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 pe in keeping the peace there in Kirkuk. But unfortunately, due to uh, emerge of ISIS in Mosul, the uh, KRG, they took over everything. And then they pumped the oil and they took the revenue without even in the revenue went to the Kurdish people in the, in the KRG. So the clause 140, uh, I think it is, it is a constitutional clause and need to be implemented. But you do need to, to keep uh, peace on the ground in order to have the census and to have the also to uh, make proper referendum, not a referendum which gives the question that whether Kirkuki people, okay. they want to join the KRG in separation from Iraq. This is against, this is a big violation in the constitution. Okay, I'm, I'm glad to inform you that Paul Davis is back and I'm gonna allow you to, to finish your point where you used Article 40 as a justification for the referendum. Go ahead. Uh, and, and basically, that's what we're talking about. The, uh, the constitutional requirements that the, the Baghdad government was supposed to have a referendum 10 years ago, and um, it, it has not. Uh, this, uh, what happened with the KRG, the referendum, was not an enforcement of an independence hall. It was a non-binding referendum on a free and fair election. Um, that with a, an intent to continue negotiations. When you have tanks rolling through your street, you are not showing good faith that you intend to have a, uh, a continuing um, negotiation. This is an enforcement uh, by dictatorship. But Paul, in retrospect, was it maybe not a good idea for them to include Kirkuk on the ballot? Because Kirkuk is a disputed area. Now that they have tanks rolling in, should they not have okay. included but it? Now we go back to Article 140 uh, as to what's supposed to not be a disputed territory. Had that referendum happened anywhere between now and the last 10 years, there would have been a different situation. Uh, the, the concept of disputed territories was supposed to have been settled, like I said, 10 years ago. Ali Daba? Yes, um, I don't think we cannot justify that the the, the clause is not being implemented. Kirkuk was unstable during the past 10 years, and there is no way to to perform this clause, definitely. And the Kurds, they know very well that it was not uh, as easy, even not possible to have the consensus in the in the in the in that governorate. And even the election was so hard to to perform it because it was unstable. And, uh, uh, and by any way, even not implementation of the clause didn't allow the Kurd to take over the Kirkuk and uh, and Mas'ud Barzani was always declaring, declaring that uh, Kirkuk is part of Kurdistan. I remember, I just give an example, in 2005 when we draft the constitution, Mas'ud Barzani had sent us a message and he said, look, two, two wars were, were uh, uh, to take Kirkuk, we are ready to make the third war and not to allow Arab to take Kirkuk. Kirkuk is a fully Kurdish, Kurdish region and this was a message to, to us in the Constitution Drafting Committee. And so there was a plan to take over Kirkuk, whether there is there is a 140 clause has been implemented or not. Uh, as you know, during the past 13, 14 years, the, the authority there on the ground, they tried to give the Kirkuk a Kurdish color. They tried to change the demography of Kirkuk by doing many things. And uh, you could ask anyone in Kirkuk, whether Arab or Turkoman right. or Christian, you could know that 
how could they took a measure in order to change the color of the city? Understood. Let me bring in Paul Davis here. P Paul Davis, you didn't just have Baghdad, but you had all the neighboring countries. You had the entire international community saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, don't do this referendum. They went ahead anyway. Yes, 93% of those who voted, voted yes. But it was seen as illegal and nobody wanted it to happen. Not Baghdad and not the international community. Is the KRG now just facing the consequences? This is why everybody was saying don't do it. And might it now lose everything? Might it now lose even the autonomy that it had beforehand? Not now, not now, not now is, is something that has been said by the Kurd, to the Kurds for a fiddly number of years. The international community was opposed to this referendum. We're talking about uh, any type of discussion uh, with, with Kurdish continued expanded federalism or independence. This is an historic situation that it's itself in. Um, it was the world was opposed to the breakup of Yugoslavia. The world was opposed to the breakup of Czechoslovakia. The world was, the, was opposed to the breakup of the Soviet Union. And then the world is opposed to the breakup of, of Iraq. Um, it, Iraq is a failed state um, and it needs to be readdressed. Uh, if not now, when? Okay. Everybody said yes. We okay, so let's take that okay. and pose it to Mark Kimmett. Mark Kimmett, from where you sit in Baghdad, are you sitting in a failed state? Well, I certainly don't see that here in, in Baghdad. The fact is that while it is an imperfect democracy at this point, uh, the fact remains it is a democracy. The prime minister is selected by a freely elected parliament. Uh, it is practicing uh, the nascent form, the beginning forms of democracy. I see that Baghdad and Iraq has put a very good force in the field with international support and is the only country, to my knowledge, that has actually evicted the major forces of ISIS out of its country. Sure, Iraq has a long way to go, but to suggest that it's a failed state, uh, that's, the kind of, that's the kind of rhetoric we hear from people that haven't been in Iraq for a very long period of time. Let me ask Ali Dabagh about weapons. I asked Mark Kimmett earlier on about, you know, how he felt about U.S. weapons being on both sides here. Ali Dabagh, your prime minister has said that the KRG is using PKK fighters and PKK weapons. Now, when, when we look at Iraq and Syria, there are many striking differences, but then there are also some extremely sharp parallels. Turkey says the SDF or, or PYD or YPG is connected to the PKK, and there's that sort of kissing point. Are we seeing the same happening now in Iraq? And if so, your prime minister has said it, where's the evidence? Unfortunately, that this they are playing with the fire. I mean, uh, they, uh, if you see, could see that Haider al Abadi in his release in a press today, he said that there is a regional uh, uh, militias from outside Kirkuk. They had a flow in mass numbers to Kirkuk. Uh, he was referring to the PKK. And this is again, um, we had warned Masoud in 2008 that he will be in confrontation with Turkey if he keeps supporting the. PKK. Murad Karalan had come in, 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 in an in a interview declaring in Erbil something a few days back. Well, this is not a good message. Uh, at the end, Iraqi, uh, Iraqi military forces, whether PKK is there in Kirkuk or they are calling them to defend Kirkuk, Iraqi military forces is going forward to reimpose uh, the federal uh, constitution on Kirkuk as it should be. And I don't think that, again, what just I want to comment, uh, we have difficulties definitely in Iraq, but we cannot, it is, un, it is unfair to say Iraq is a failed state. Iraq is facing and Iraq is fighting against the United, uh, uh, on behalf of United States, on behalf of many, many nations on uh, ISIS. And definitely uh, Iraq had succeeded and huge stories of success we had achieved in, in the victory against ISIS. This should be appreciated, not to uh, nominate Iraq as a failed state. Let me ask this to Mark Kimmett. If Barzani has enlisted the support of the PKK, is that a massive mistake? Well, let's be very clear. The PKK is a declared terrorist organization of the United States. Having said that, I, I don't know for a fact whether they have enlisted the support 
Look, let, let's again pull back from the rhetoric. Let's pull back from the KRG talking points and focus on what's important here. What's important is that the country remains unified, fights a common enemy, together works towards developing an imperfect democracy into a perfect democracy, which it will never achieve, but it can only get better from where it is right now. The United States remains committed to both sides. I've been in Erbil in the past six weeks. I've been into Baghdad uh, for that same period of time. The, the fact remains is we have friends on both sides. We are disappointed that this can't be uh, achieved, a, a level of reconciliation can be achieved in the near term. That's why the United States will continue to support both sides to promote dialogue. This fighting between these two partners uh, just simply takes away from the real fight, and that's the fight against ISIS and other external forces that are affecting the stability inside of Iraq. Ali Debah, why is Baghdad sending the president, Fuad Masoum, no disrespect to the man, but he doesn't have the power of the prime minister. Why is Baghdad sending the president to meet with Barzani and Soleimania? Why doesn't Abadi go himself? Well, I, I think that he, the, the president is the, they are, he is the protecting the constitution and he is uh, representing all Iraqis. And I think what he's doing uh, is good. Um, and uh, you do need somebody to mediate. And uh, we would prefer, now uh, with all respect to the, what the United States is doing, but an Iraqi mediation is much better, and uh, which make especially that Fuad Masoum is a Kurdish, yeah. and he is uh, till now he is uh, behave as he is uh, an Iraqi citizen, in, in not taking a side from any way, uh, and this will allow him to mediate carefully. Now, dialogue is very important. I think that it is a time for everybody to calm down yeah. and to. Uh, not to allow to ignite um, a fire again in in the region, and uh, I think we, uh, the government of Iraq, uh, as Abadi said, that definitely he is calling for dialogue, and he do need to meet. This all is a preparation. I think it could help in meeting both men in order to find ways to perform uh, uh, what is needed to protect both uh, uh, Kurdish uh, people as well as the Arabs. And all they are Iraqis, definitely, that the government, the federal government, is responsible to protect the Kurdish people as well. Uh, I, I hope, and everybody hope, that this could not be... We don't want to have the back history of uh, wars uh, between us and the Kurd. Uh, it was a very blood history. We don't want to repeat it again. Mark Hamid, uh, Ali Dabakh seems extremely confident that the fighting will die down and the central government will stabilize the situation in Kirkuk. But the reports I've been reading in the hours leading up to this discussion only seem to show that the fighting was escalating. What's your view on that? Is it getting worse or better? Well, I, I, first of all, I've seen no evidence that the situation is escalating in terms of violence on the ground. Uh, it is clear that forces are moving both in both directions, some advancing, some withdrawing. But any reports that there has been large-scale military conflict between the two. So I remain hopeful that in the next few days the situation will resolve itself on the ground. Uh, most importantly, that that situation resolving itself will be at an absolute minimum amount of violence, and certainly we can hope for no loss of life. Okay, Mark Hemet, Ali Dabar, and Paul Davis, and we apologize for the choppy Skype exactly. connection that Paul Davis had, gentlemen. It's been. A pleasure having you on the Newsmakers. I thank you for joining us once again. In a moment, could EU sanctions on Myanmar change the future of the Rohingya? And later in the program, could a cholera crisis force a diplomatic breakthrough in the war in Yemen? EU foreign ministers have met to discuss imposing sanctions on Myanmar, and the country's top generals seem to be the target. That's due to the army's offensive that has driven more than half a million Rohingya Muslims into Bangladesh. But an EU arms embargo already exists, and Europe likely won't hit Myanmar's economy too hard for fear of destabilizing the wider region. So, 
How much impact could new sanctions really have? Shoaib Hassan explains. It's a slap on the wrist for something the UN says is ethnic cleansing. The European Union is cutting contacts with Myanmar's top military officials over their campaign against the Rohingya minority. The operation has forced more than half a million Rohingya to flee the country. We addressed the situation in Myanmar and the, the Rohingya refugee crisis. We want to see a de-escalation of tensions and a full adherence to international human rights obligations in Myanmar, as well as full humanitarian access so the aid can reach those in need. The EU lifted sanctions against military rule Myanmar in 2012 after elections which pro-democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi's party won. It was part of an international reconciliation towards the country and later expanded to economic ties currently worth $1.8 billion annually. Growing concerns over the treatment of the Rohingya means the EU is now debating a rollback. That's as refugees stream across the border into neighboring India and Bangladesh. Myanmar denies it's responsible for the violence and instead blames insurgents for attacks. The witnesses told us what happened and where the bodies could be buried. Our security personnel knew according to their reports. We proceeded according to the provided information. We can say this is terrorism. The EU's condemnation seems unlikely to change Myanmar's position, as the West has little real clout inside the country. That position belongs to its main trading partner, China, and it's steadfastly on Myanmar's side. But will the EU's latest actions have any effect on the military junta as they continue their campaign against the Rohingya? Shweb Hassan, The Newsmakers. Well, joining me now from London is Win Nying. He's the UK party chairman of the National League for Democracy Liberated Area. And in Johannesburg, we have Akshaya Kumar. She's the deputy United Nations director at Human Rights Watch. I thank you both for joining us. Akshaya Kumar, let me begin with you. This idea that the EU might cut ties with Myanmar, is that a good idea? Well, I think it is a good idea. The EU are taking an important step in Hello. the right direction to show Myanmar's generals, especially, that there will be costs and consequences for continuing this killing, this ethnic cleansing, and uh, this reprise of crimes against humanity against the Rohingya Muslim community of that country. Win Nang, this shows that there are repercussions for ethnic cleansing, according to Akshaya Kumar, if, if the EU decides to cut ties with Myanmar. I'm presuming you disagree. Tell me why. Right. Uh, I don't think there's a ethnic cleansing and there's no sure message or information. Actually, these are unconfirmed messages and information coming out because we are living 7,000 away from Burma. We don't know what's going on there. We don't know what happened there. So I cannot confirm that uh, ethnic cleansing is happening there. I, I sincerely hope that uh, believe that this is a fake uh, fake news, fake information, not uh, confirmed information. I just want to make everything confirmed before doing anything. And uh, EU has helped, had uh, helped our democratization for so many years. We are very grateful for them. For this matter, uh, very, very dangerous matter for our country and for our nation. It's very important and it, uh, they have been in our country for centuries. And it has been happening long, long ago, and then not uh, recently happened. So I just want to uh, request the EU personnel to wait for some time until everything is confirmed, and okay. then we need so, uh, to Mr. confirm Nine, everything if allow before me to come in here. anything is decided. Certainly, if you'll allow me to come in. It's not just Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International as well, the United Nations. They've all used the label ethnic cleansing. The French President Emmanuel Macron has gone a step further and has called it a genocide. Are you telling me, sir, that they are all being duped by fake news? Even Mr. Kofi Annan has already declared recently that. That's why I would like to request uh, to wait for a fake fighting mission after they have confirmed something, you should do something. 
Okay, so Akshaya, this seems to be the predominant line that comes through. I mean, actually, what, we, what we're hearing from, from Win Nying is, is kind of a softer line than we usually get because in covering the story over the past couple of months, I found that some have said, well, actually, these people deserve to have their homes burnt down or evicted from their homes because they're members of ARSA and because they've committed attacks and so on. Tell me how difficult it is, Akshaya, to actually open a line of communication with the government of Myanmar because of this denialism. Look, we continue to hear their allegations that all of this is fake news or fabricated in spite of the proof that groups like mine have collected, including satellite imagery showing burned villages, horrific testimonies of persecution, rape, sexual violence, the burning of villages, the killing of young men and boys. And to all this, all we get is obstruction and denialism. At a certain point, uh, asking us to wait, asking us to continue to delay action is actually asking us to be complicit in this campaign. And we just refuse to do that. The international community, whether it's at the UN or the EU, needs to take action. And today what we saw with the EU was one step. They've actually decided that they will no longer invite Myanmar Myanmar's senior military officials, including Senior General Min Aung Lang, to their member states in recognition of the gravity of the disproportionate response taken by the Myanmar military in this current right. campaign. Akshaya, that seems to be quite tame when you think about it, right? They're just not inviting the generals to their meetings. Is that a hint or a suggestion, or more than a suggestion even, that nobody's really prepared to do a lot to stop what's going on in Rakhine State. The most that the EU is doing is disinviting a few military people from meetings. That's not a lot. You're right. It, it's a first step, and it's really a paltry step in light of the abuses that we've seen. My organization has counted at least 288 villages burned in northern Rakhine State, including over 60 since September 5th, when Aung San Suu Kyi and other members of Myanmar's military have claimed that their operations have ended. And so we see that even there, there's just not a relationship between the narrative being promoted by Myanmar's government and uh, that which is being accepted by the international community. And that's why people have been so reluctant to move forward. But I think it's going to change. This was a first small step, but we're also seeing action in New York at the General Assembly, where a number of states are working on a resolution to challenge uh, exactly what's going on and right. to push uh, those countries with power to take action. Win Nine, you heard some stats and facts there from Akshaya, including 288 villages being burned. Why would she lie about your country? What if what if what if what she's saying is true? Isn't it in your interest, sir, for the government of Myanmar to deal with this horrendous situation so it doesn't get worse? Yes. Yes, I got the information that the houses were burned down by the ASA and by the villagers, not by the soldiers, not fired from the government staff. I, I totally uh, disagree that fight. That the, the, actually, the people who burned down are the villagers and the ASA soldiers, not our, the army soldiers, not from the Burmese army. And also, one more thing I would like to mention you, okay? The people who fled into Bangladesh, they are only children, women, and old people. Where are their husbands? Where are the breadwinners? Where are they? They are in the Asa army, in the, in the rebellion. That's why I'm telling you, we are just trying to get the peace. We are trying try to get the humanitarian aid to the villagers, and we welcome okay. back. So let me, voluntary repatriation so has so been let me welcome. See if I understand we are not you, doing sir, against them. And I apologize for interrupting. I know there's a slight delay. Let me see if I understand you completely here. Those more than half a million people that have fled across the border, the people we're seeing in Cox's Bazaar and other parts of Bangladesh, who have fled with nothing, many are starving, they've seen their families killed and so on. You're saying that you know for sure that they are women and children and that the men in their family are ARSA members and therefore they are paying the price for the men in their families being terrorists. Is, is that how you see it? Yes, what I mean to say is uh, the only children, women, and old people are coming into going into the Bangladesh. Where are the men? Where are they? What they what are they doing? Why we've they seen, don't we've seen countless images of men going across the Bangladesh? Can I can I Why? can Where I cut in now? here because in, my organization. 
my organization, and in fact, I came from the border areas where our researchers are hearing about what happens to these men and boys. And in so many cases, we have documented, and in fact, we've published this information, that the men uh, were separated from the women and children. They were lined up. They were shot point blank by men wearing uniforms that matched the description of the uniforms worn by Myanmar's military, not by the clothing of any villagers or by the Arsa. We've also heard accounts that the villages were burned, again, by men wearing uniforms of those part of the okay. Myanmar security services. So let me, let me take that. Win 9, you asked, where are the men? Guess what? You killed them. That's where they yes. are. No, 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 no. Why are you totally laughing, disagree. Sir? It's not that. Story is the wrong story. That's why I, I started with the fake message, fake information, not the right story. That's why I'm telling you. Uh, we are not killing the people. We are, why we have to kill the people? Now, ASA has been asking their people to go to leave the northern Arkan. That's why they are doing that, you know? That, that's they are doing. Uh, we are not uh, doing any, any wrong. We are just staying in our country. We are just treating as human rights... Uh, uh, you know, rights which to, to people who are coming in. This, these people have been in our country since the colonial time of the British government. Akshay Kumar, how okay. Are we, okay, Akshay Kumar, how are we going to find any sort of resolution here if we, we see from the side of the Myanmar government they don't believe that they're doing anything wrong whatsoever and they don't believe they've even committed the slightest of mistakes? Well, the, the simple thing that the Myanmar can, government can do if they want okay, us all no. to know the truth is allow people into northern Rakhine state. Uh, there's been very limited access, especially for independent human rights groups, for the UN authorized fact finding mission, for journalists. If, uh, if there are questions about what's happening, simply allow us in. Why don't you allow Win 9? Why don't you allow the independent fact finders in? Yes, yes. Now, the Aung San Suu Kyi has already declared that she will work with the United Nations. She is looking for all the people to, for the, I have already told, voluntary repatriation. She welcome, and she is looking after uh, to give uh, humanitarian aid to those people. Okay, and when those people come back, are you, are you happy to, to this is welcome... This a big issue. When, when the refugees yeah. who are in Bangladesh come back to Myanmar, do you support them being treated well and them being given citizenship as citizens of Myanmar? Uh, I'm not the government. The government has you're already declared... The, you're a member they have of the ruling party. organized a, a, a council to look after them. You're, you're, a, you're a representative of, uh, of the ruling party. So I, uh, do you yeah, support the citizenship I'm, I'm of these 7, stateless people? I'm here 7,000 miles away. I can't answer... But, but earlier you I told me... I don't have the power to but give certainly, you an answer certainly, because but, I'm... I'm, yeah, 7,000 miles. Okay, but earlier you told me you had intimate details of what was going on in terms of Arsa's crimes. Now you're saying you're 7,000 miles away, so you don't know what's going on. So I, I, I'm not even sure why we invited you onto the program then. Uh, Win Nying and Akshaya Kumar, I have to move on, but I thank you both for joining no, no. us. I... It is a terrible situation for the Rohingya people. Okay. Thanks again okay, for joining us you, on the Newsmakers. You. How bad is the war in Yemen? Well, it might take one of history's worst ever cholera outbreaks to find a diplomatic solution. Right now, Yemeni officials expect a million people will get the disease by the end of the year. And it's looking more apparent that the country's warring factions need to come together to stop the epidemic. But there's no sign of such cooperation yet. Sandra Gatman has more. Yemen's cholera epidemic is now the largest and fastest spreading outbreak in modern history. 2,000 people have already died from the disease. By the end of this year, more than a million cases are expected. 600,000 of them will be children. That's a higher count than recorded in Haiti. The reason why cholera spread in Yemen is because of the ongoing war, which began in 2015. It's led to the deterioration of Yemen's institutions, including the medical and sewage systems. Yemen's conflict has raged on for two and a half years. 
dogfighting between Saudi-backed forces loyal to ousted President Mansour Hadi and Iran-sponsored Houthi rebels has killed at least 10,000 people. And both sides blame each other for mass civilian suffering. In Yemen, there are no winners on the battlefield, and the Yemeni people remain the biggest losers who are paying the highest price for this war. The parties have to commit to end all hostilities and start discussions for a comprehensive peace agreement. Pressure is piling on the warring sides to resume a peace agreement that fell apart last year. Kuwait had hosted the talks at the time and says it's ready to do it again. But skepticism is rife. A first step would see the rivals agree on a permanent ceasefire. But the Saudi-led coalition is worried that would cement a permanent split between Yemen's north and south. To complicate the negotiations, Yemen's rebels are increasingly divided between Shia Houthis and supporters of President Saleh. The sheer number of players at the table may also make peace talks difficult. But with levels of cholera and famine reaching new highs, can all sides be pushed to change course? Sandra Gatman, The Newsmakers. Let's go to our panel now. Gerald Feierstein joins me from Washington, D.C. He's a former U.S. ambassador to Yemen under Barack Obama. In Gothenburg, Sweden, we have Afrah Nasser. She's the founder and editor-in-chief of the online magazine, The Sun Eye Review. And with me here in studio is Kokab Athaybani. She was a communications specialist at the U.N. Development Program. I thank you all for joining us. It's a, it's a disgraceful situation when you look at the cholera epidemic. I mean, the fact that there possibly will be one million cases by the end of the year. It's a disgrace to everybody involved in this conflict. Um, I think everybody agrees that this is a man-made crisis because without the war, you wouldn't have cholera. But which man? Which man's responsible for this? Which man or which men? Kokab, let me begin with you. Who do you think is fundamentally to blame for cholera and for the current situation in Yemen? Um, 2011, we started like a revolution because we wanted a better state. Because, as you know, Yemen has been like an already poor country and suffers from um, poor infrastructure and poor services. I would blame the international community for their meddling in, in the Yemen um, situation because in 2011 we were about to have, like we were trying to lay the foundation for a civil state, for a, the state we want to do. But unfortunately in the GCC brokered initiative they provide immunity to the former um, president and the former regime which has put our like the transitional period in risk. And as you know that the um, health situation and the livelihoods of people are um, um, are related to the political situation and the, um, the um, stability of the country. So I would say for me, I think the without the um, misunderstanding of the international community to the situation of Yemen, we would have better, you mm -hmm. know, country now. Afra Nasser, who's to blame for the current situation in Yemen? Um, I think all warring parties are to blame. Uh, even before the war began, uh, Yemen has always been uh, ranked as the, the poorest Arab country for many decades uh, and one of the poorest countries in the world. So with the, the ongoing conflict, I think it's like uh, the second uh, conflict because uh, the first war was the, the Houthi-led uh, you know, uh, rebellion uh, or a Houthi-led coup against the, 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 the legitimate uh, government uh, of uh, President Hadi. And then you know, the, uh, the involvement or the intervention of the Saudi-led coalition came as an extension to the to the violence and and and, and of course all these uh, you know um, uh, consecutive uh, conflicts have really drained out the country and mm -hmm. drained out the already uh, impoverished uh, country in the region so i think the main question should be really not um, who is responsible of the cholera because uh, you know, the, the disaster is unfolding in front of uh, uh, the world's watch, and the question should be how to stop it. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And that's yep. Ambassador Gerald Feierstein, when we look at the numbers, the more than 10,000 dead, the fact that 19.3 million Yemenis don't have access to clean water and sanitation, the cholera numbers are absolutely 
mind-blowing. Might all of that embarrass the international community enough to finally work harder towards a political resolution? Well, I don't think that there's been any lack of effort on the part of the international community to encourage the Yemeni parties to the conflict to find a solution. Uh, the issue is that uh, up until now, the parties really haven't been willing to uh, sit down and negotiate. I agree with your last, uh, with your last commentator that it's unproductive to try to find the person or persons who are responsible for this. Everybody shares responsibility. Uh, there are ideas on the table. There are uh, efforts underway, not only to negotiate a political way forward to resolve the conflict, but also in the interim, at least to have the parties cooperate so that humanitarian relief can get in, food, medicine, uh, other nece uh, necessary uh, uh, items can get in to try to help Right. The Yemeni people address some of these dire uh, issues that they're confronting. Yes, uh, Mr. Ambassador, you know, we, we're seeing that Hudaida has been surrounded. So the argument is they don't want weapons to come in, and that's fine, but they also seem to be blocking food, medicine, and so on, as you mentioned. That's the Saudi led coalition, that's the blockade that contributes to the exacerbation of the humanitarian crisis. Don't you think, Mr. Ambassador, that the United States and the United Kingdom? share some of this blame because they've essentially given the Saudi-led coalition a blank check? Well, one, the, the U.S. and the U.K. haven't given the Saudi-led uh, coalition a blank check. Uh, two, the, uh, it's arguable about whether or not it's really the coalition that's blocking the delivery of supplies. Uh, we just had Dr. Rabia from the King Salman Center here in the U.S. Uh, a couple of weeks ago. He uh, pledged that there would be no ship carrying food that would be delayed for more than 48 hours uh, calling on Hodeida. Uh, there is uh, equally a, a problem with delivery inside of the country that's not related to the Saudi-led coalition. The Houthis have laid siege to Taz for the entire duration of this mm -hmm. conflict and are trying to starve that city. So again, I don't think it's productive to say that this party or that party is responsible. Certainly. Everybody shares responsibility. C certainly, Mr. Ambassador, if, if you'll allow me to interrupt you, and I apologize for that. So we had, for example, as you said, the Houthis laid siege to ties, and that's all well and good. It's, it's documented, and that's a crime by the Houthis. Uh, a Reuters investigation showing the Kota Nazar, a Singaporean ship, with 636 containers of steel, paper, medicine, and other goods, set sail to Hodeida, blocked by a Saudi warship blocking Yemen's port. So if I, if I give you that example, would you consider that to be a war crime by the Saudi-led coalition? I have no idea what the details of that specific incident are without knowing uh, uh, more about it, why that particular ship was blocked. Uh, I couldn't really uh, judge one way or the other. Kokaba Thaybani, who's more to blame? If I, if I adjust my question to you. Um, as um, Afra said, we need to stop this from going on. But I think, um, as I said earlier, that I think the approaches of the international community to address this issue has to be changed. They have not to talk to the, you know, the Houthi and Saleh uh, forces in order to settle this, you know, um, um, issue. Um, unfortunately, this has happened in, in the GCC uh, brokered initiative, and then it turns out to be like a failure. And then the peace and partnership peace agreement, and then it turns into um, another failure. So um, the international community has to revisit their approaches to Yemen. And unfortunately, this has become worse by the Saudis, where, it, where their intervention in Yemen has made the situation worse and to be honest like um, the Houthi and Saleh um, control over Yemen now is because of the Saudi support from the beginning so um, if we want to blame we need also to ask the international community to change their approaches to Yemen their more f their most fair is what we understand is is they're afraid from the expansion of al-Qaeda over Yemen but they're not afraid but they're also afraid of an expansion of Iranian influence via the Houthis yeah but this is the fear of of, of the Saudis more than right. yeah but this is not if if you want to address a problem you need to address its root 
and the international community and the diplomacy has been carried out has pro be proven to be not taken the right, right approach. First, it fails, and it, there are many initiatives and agreements, and this has made the people lost their faith in their approaches. People, if they want to, say, to sign any agreement, they know that mm. there is no enough pressure from the international community to pass it over. And also, like, the international community cares more about tourism, and Saudi cares more about Iranian expansion. And there is no care about the ultimate goal of the Yemeni people, that they have a real state that protect their rights and also lay the foundation for a better infrastructure in the future. Mm -hmm. And it, the cholera is a normal result of what is right. going on. Yeah, symptomatic of what's going on. Exactly. Uh, Efra Nasser, if the Saudi-led coalition, might there, be, might there be a silver lining here? If the Saudi-led coalition can go so far as to allow a Russian medical team into Sana'a to treat Ali Abdullah Saleh, as has been reported, might that be a sign that they're willing to compromise a bit more than they were willing to in the past? Might, they, might that be a little glimmer of hope? Um, you have to, to understand also, like, this is the second time that, that uh, the Saudis intervene to, uh, you know, save the, the health of uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh. Uh, the former president, uh, and even till today, uh, his son is in in uh, custody, or uh, his uh, residency is in the United Arab Emirates, and that gives you an idea about the you know how how strange and ironic is th this war, when they have you know uh, uh, some of the main faces uh, leading uh, the 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 uh, you know uh, in in alliance with the Houthis, uh, leading uh, civil war in the country, and they're still not finding way mm -hmm. to have you know, communication. But I think the the the, the, the issue with Yemen war, uh, even with the cholera, is just a symptom of of you know a larger problem, um, um, and and it's. It's, it's great that it's highlighting, you know, talking about the politic aspect of the conflict. But I think the root of the problem is that, you know, when when states intervene in civil wars, that usually prolongs the, the war and make the already complicated civil war more complicated. And that's what we're seeing mm -hmm. today. Uh, so uh, talking about the cholera and, 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 and blocking food and the, the, you know, the humanitarian crisis, really, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, it is narrowing down the, the, the conflict in Yemen uh, from the humanitarian aspect and not really going into deep of the politics right. and how to find ways to resolve the conflict. Certainly. It wasn't hit by a natural disaster. These are all symptomatic of a terrible political situation. You mentioned ironies and twists. I'm interested to hear from you, Ambassador Feierstein, on the ironies of, and twists regarding Ali Abdullah Saleh. You would have met the man, you would have dealt with him uh, directly uh, during your time as yes. ambassador. At that time, he was a U.S. ally. Now he is not, and he's the mastermind behind the rise of the Houthis. Tell me about the man. Tell me about the enigma that is Ali Abdullah Saleh. And did he pull a fast one over you, the United States? Well, I, I think that uh, uh, what happened is, uh, obviously, as uh, some of your guests have already pointed out, uh, uh, certainly we were very concerned about the rise of violent extremism in Yemen. Uh, we did uh, work to cooperate with Ali Abdullah Saleh in an effort to contain that, to keep it not only from becoming a threat to the Yemeni people themselves, but also in the region and globally. Uh, and so we, uh, we did uh, have a relationship with Saleh, but, uh, but the fact of the matter is that when uh, uh, young people in Yemen took to the streets to protest against the government, uh, my government, as well as uh, our partners and allies around the world, uh, uh, worked with uh, the, uh, the parties in, in Yemen to try to gain a peaceful uh, transition from Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, to a successor government. And we worked very hard uh, to try to, uh, uh, to uh, have an opportunity for the Yemeni people to come together and address their political and economic and social issues in a peaceful way. Unfortunately, Ali Abdullah Saleh uh, is, uh, uh, was one of the principal uh, uh, actors in undermining the political transition and, uh, and preventing the, the kind of uh, peaceful uh, political process that we all hope to achieve and that the GCC initiative uh, provided uh, a framework and an opportunity to achieve. Mm -hmm. So uh, the reality is that Ali Abdullah Saleh, unfortunately, 
uh, refused to take advantage of the opportunities that he was given uh, to live peacefully. The only one of the Arab leaders affected by the Arab Spring who was given an opportunity to live at peace in his own country. Uh, and uh, rather than that, he worked very hard to undermine the transition, including this alliance that he's forged with the Houthis. Yeah, that was really great to get your insights there. Kaukab, let me, let me end with you because we're running out of time. Is there anything to be optimistic about? Um, I think, like, um, in Yemen after 2011, the international community has a pro-type and the people have a pro-type about the Arab country. But 2011 has, sh has shown that Yemenis are not like what they are portrayed. Poor country, they have less understanding of democracy. We show that we want democracy and we are working hard to it. Maybe what you see, the extremism and the problem around, is showing that Yemen is falling apart. But I'm sure that there is a new emerging power is, is coming out, and I'm sure in the near future, this, this power will emerge and will be ready when the country is going through like a stabilization period. Well, we hope so, and we yes. wish the people of Yemen all the best. Kokab Thaybani, Afrat Nasser, and Ambassador Gerald Feierstein, I thank you all for sharing your thoughts with us here on the Newsmakers. And that's all for this edition of the Newsmakers with me, Imran Garda. You can check out more of our stories on YouTube, Facebook and Twitter. Remember to like, follow and subscribe. Next time, the US lifts decades of sanctions against Sudan. But were any real reforms made? Until then, thanks for watching. Bye-bye.